Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Purdue's Presidential Lecture Series. And tonight, very excited and delighted to welcome to Purdue an outstanding scientist and leader. And tonight's speaker is the inventor of quantum rods. Back in the 1980s at Bell Labs, what is now known as quantum dots were invented. And tonight's speaker was right there. And throughout the 90s, he invented ways to grow them into different shapes so that not only these are size-dependent optical electrical properties, but also now he could mold them into different shapes. And then he started assembling them into much larger scale and applying them to a wide range of topics, from LEDs to bio labels uh, to solar panels, including a number of his own companies. And so happens, tonight's speaker also served as the director of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory for many years, the provost at Cal Berkeley, uh, and now our neighbor, the 14th president of the University of Chicago, Paul Alavistatos. Paul, please. Hello. Hello. Thank you for please. Well, President Alibisatos, uh, this is indeed uh, named after you now, uh, Presidential Lecture Series. Uh, All right. And I, I think know that's where your, we... that's your name. Oh, uh, well, it's uh, <laughs> my predecessor, Mitch Daniels, naming. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we've got uh, a wide range of topics we can have the fireside chat about. Uh, perhaps we could start with your outstanding career as a scientist and your invention over the years uh, have earned accolades, including the Wolf Prize in Chemistry uh, and the National Medal of Science. I don't know how many university presidents are winners of National Medal of Science these days. Uh, well, uh, you've done amazing work, uh, including in what I just briefly described, not doing justice, but you know, in preparing for tonight's lecture, I uh, took some lessons from our own chemistry professors. <laughs> some of them were your former postdocs and students, uh -huh. and they told me that you still have a lab and still Absolutely. do research. Uh, I tried to do that. I promised myself on weekends and holidays I'll do a bit of research. Well, you know, I'm still trying. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, back in the 90s, in particular, you discovered some 2,6 compounds, such as CAD selenide, that allowed you to control the shape of these quantum no longer dots, because they can be all kinds of shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then you applied it to all these very different domains of applications. Uh, so was there a particular aha moment when you say, ha, ah, I heard impurity had a role to play there. This is the, <laughs> how I can shape how these can shape quantum the rods. Yeah. Well, you know, like, I, actually, uh, let me say something a little bit. I, it, I'm going to answer the question, but I'm going to come at it a little from the mm. side, you know. So um, my fascination with um, how atoms form on tiny structures actually started when I was an undergrad at Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I was in the library. I was, I was in a PCHEM lab, and there was this experiment where, and it'll relate to this, there was this experiment where... Um, you know, most people in physical chemistry lab feel like they just would like to exit as quickly as possible. But for me, I was, I, you know, for me it was I was like, one of those. Uh, yeah, that is. no, I mean, it's a normal reaction. <laughs> and so, you know, but, but here's what there was. There was this um, bulb that you could put a, a metal gas in and a plate that was cold and then another with a screen on it, a phosphor screen. And you could, um, uh, you know, the, under an electric field, the metal atoms would condense on this plate and grow a wire. And then as the, as the wire got longer, it would emit electrons that would hit the screen and make light. And it turned out that if you worked it out, you could show that atoms could hit anywhere on the surface of that wire and then move to the very end and join it. And I still remember sitting in Harper Library as this, you know, undergrad, and just thinking, 
that is unbelievable to me that somebody can figure out how the little atoms move around on the surface of this thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, that became a kind of obsession in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed, it's true that at a certain moment in time, we figured out ways to make crystals into those kinds of shapes as well as all kinds of others. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was really a fun experience to learn how to do that with my coworkers who were very inventive, are very inventive people. So a lot of it is trying to keep up with them. Mm. Well, if you're curious, uh, out of the many papers and citations, by the way, about 190,000 citations to President Alvisato's papers. So here's the 1996 paper in Science um, where you talked about uh, the size-dependent optical electrical properties, and then the ability to join the dots into complex mm -hmm. assemblies. And then 1998, here's a Nature paper, application to biological labels. And this 2000 paper is where there's a clear visualization of the um, shape control. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you can see it from yeah. a distance, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all available online if you log in from a Purdue domain there. Mm. Uh, now, uh, what prompted you to take these scientific breakthroughs into startup companies that you co-founded? Hmm. Well, first of all, let me just, so people won't be completely mystified here, let me explain the, um, why these materials are studied at all, which is the quantum size effect that you mentioned. So, so let me um, uh, give a feeling for this. If you've ever been to one of those science museums where they have those kind of funnel shapes and you can throw a ball in and then, you know, as the ball kind of goes down towards the center, it goes faster and faster and faster like that. So if you think about a little piece of semiconductor, a tiny one, you know, maybe it's 10 atoms across, you know, 1,000 atoms. Yeah, you think about one of those, um, all the atoms are held together by the electrons inside there now that are forming the bonds. If you come in with some energy and you put extra energy into an electron, it gets kicked free from the atoms that it was held next to, and actually it starts to zoom around inside that crystal. So it's like dropping a ball into that surface, and it'll just zing around inside there. And then if it then falls back down <clears throat> into the hole that was you know, created, it will emit light. And uh, the color of that light will be um, uh, a different color as the crystal gets smaller because that electron is zinging around faster, just like that ball is zooming around faster. So that's, that's a kind of um, uh, hokey explanation of the quantum size effect, but it, it serves. And uh, indeed, it's possible to make these tiny crystals in ways that they will very precisely match the colors of the receptors in your eye. So if you want to make a, a display of some kind, uh, I don't know if these really use quantum dots, but they, you know, they, yeah, they might. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, the, you know, unambiguously the best displays, you know, do use the quantum dots, and they are very, they are very beautiful displays. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, holding to each and frozen, so the budget, I'm not sure, <laughs> afford us. Uh, the best LED screens. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the reason to want them, of course, is because if you can create the red, green, and blue such that they'll match the receptors in your eye very precisely and they're, and they're narrow, they're not too broad, then you can recreate all the colors that you're capable of seeing. Whereas if, the, if, the, if they kind of miss those receptors or they're kind of too broad or something, then the colors just won't look natural and you won't be able to cover the full color gamut. So, um, you know, um, the question of how I got involved in, in starting these various companies um, has to do with, um, you know, a bit of a, you know, again, a, a personal preference, if you like. Um, when I was a grad student, uh, everything uh, that we were taught was around, uh, let's say, uh, abstracted knowledge that you were trying to create. And I had this yearning for it to actually do something in the world, so I felt very um, strongly about that. And I had the opportunity to go to Bell Labs, which was an amazing environment that brought all those elements uh, together. So yeah, when we started the research at Berkeley, you know, we were hunting for places where we could find some applications. And the light emission is what you know really stuck out early on. So um, the biological applications emerged uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, the displays in due time as well. Mm -hmm. Well, by the way, that was the clearest the pedagogical explanation 
um, I have heard uh, in describing how uh, the optical properties depend on the uh, size of the uh, quantum dots. Uh, were there any particular surprises as you took breakthroughs inside laboratories into startup companies? Oh, golly. Uh, well, one thing I could, here's an anecdote that was kind of uh, a bit of a shock to me. So uh, we had, in fact, um, done some early work demonstrating that these tiny crystals could be put inside uh, biological specimens, inside a cell or on the surface of one and so on, and then they could be used as labels and they had advantages. They didn't bleach, they could last for much longer, they had multiple colors so you could see different things. So it was clearly, you know, it was going pretty good. And so uh, my colleagues and I, we started a little company called Quantum Dot Corporation and they got capitalized like good companies do and all of a sudden they had this team and the team goes to work and, you know, guess what? They're like professionals, you know. I mean, we're, you know, we're a bunch of students and a professor that kind of, you know, we're all kind of stumbling around. You know, these folks just get really serious about it. And so I'd say about three months later, uh, they were way beyond what we knew how to do. I mean, just way beyond what we knew how to do inside the company. And, you know, I'm visiting back and forth. And I'm there interacting with my coworkers. And you know, it, it, it was pretty clear that if we wanted to, we could probably do, I don't know, maybe three, four years worth of publishing of some papers in that area uh, before the materials would kind of get completely disseminated everywhere. But for me, I would come back from this company and then look at what we were doing in the group. And it, it just kind of all the you know air went out of the balloon for me. I, mean, I knew these other people were doing things that were you know, and so I just really pushed on the group to kind of shift and try to do something a little bit different in that space. And actually, if there's one thing I've learned about that, it's that um, it's really important to have that real cross fertilization between the universities and what's happening in, in these kinds of areas and what's happening in the world outside um, because then you can, you know, you always want to work on something where you're going to add the most value. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the universities add the most value at that very early phase of kind of discovery. And so, so you've got to push yourself to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk away from something I know I can keep doing for a little while because if I push myself to try to do the next one, I'll probably be at the stage where I'll do something, you know, that will contribute again. And, and that was a, you know, that was just like a complete shock to me. I had not expected mm -hmm. that to happen, but it was like a mm -hmm. big lesson. Well, that is a unique value add. We'll come back to that, uh, the rows of universities. Uh, yeah. But then uh, you took a turn to serve uh, in a national laboratory. So uh, how did the dark side of administration get hold of you? <laughs> You might disagree with the premise, but... Uh. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so, uh, you yeah, know, okay, I have a story about this too, you know. So, um, here's what happened. There was this moment in time, and you described some of it, where we just got really good at making these materials. And, you know, I don't know if we were the best, but we were certainly up there. You know, one of the very best places for doing this kind of thing. And so I'd go around as faculty are want to do in order to promote the work, visit different places, tell people about what we were doing. And, you know, at that moment, because of that, you know, brief period of having this edge, people would come up and just say, you know, um, I tried to do this in the lab and that's what happened and so on. And it's just my personality. I just would say, okay, come to the lab, um, send somebody, we'll, we'll show them how to do it. And um, at one point, there were so many people visiting that my research group rebelled. Hmm. And they think we actually have to get some work. I didn't here. know that could happen. Yeah, uh, no, it can. It, well, it depends on you know the uh, permissiveness of the environment, which you know you can guess. In my case, it's pretty permissive. And so you know, there you go. Uh, they didn't want to do it anymore. And and you know, actually, that really upset me. Uh, it turns out because uh, it felt to me like it was an ethical duty of a scientist mm -hmm. to be open in sharing what they did. And so there was this conflict now between wanting on the one hand to foster the learning of students and, and our own discovery with what the community seemed to want from us. And, and so it stuck with me. And, and you know, there was this uh, wonderful friend of mine at the time, I'm still a friend, 
but at the time in, in physics, Paul McEwen, and you know, we were talking about this one day, and we spent some time thinking, and we said, well, you know, maybe we should have a place which is dedicated to, it's a set of labs and scientists whose job is to share how to make stuff. And that set us on a path, and we proposed this idea, and, and, and was successful in creating something called the Molecular Foundry, mm -hmm. which is a nanoscience sharing center um, at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, that has you know hundreds of scientists there. I'm sure today there's a whole group of them sharing how to make these materials, and it worked. It was a very successful thing. I was the first director. I'm sitting there as the director, and it wasn't just our way of making materials. It was lots of ways of making you know, nanomaterials all at once, including methods I would never have known anything about. And so all of a sudden, I'm there interacting with all these people, and they're sharing ideas for how to make things that are so new to me. And I'm just saying, wow, this is incredible. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, I was going back to my research group, and we were doing much more because we had these other kind of dimensions of learning. And uh, I found great joy in that. I found I really liked it. And so, you know, then one thing led to another. And when Steve Chu came to be the lab director at, at Lawrence Berkeley, and then he went off to be Secretary of Energy. Uh, and so I was left holding the bag, you know, becoming uh, the lab director there. And I enjoyed that too. You know, when I was lab director, I, I was able to arrange it so that pretty much every day um, I would learn something about science that I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I try in the job that I'm in now, too, every day to learn an idea that's happening at mm -hmm. the university I'm at that is new to me or that I didn't know before. And somehow I found my own kind of intellectual research activities and this kind of larger collective thing. Mm -hmm. I, I like, I don't think, you know, this, it is, people will say this quite often, you know, that these are just completely different things. But to me, they're all part of being part of a community. Mm -hmm. They're all connect. They're not, I don't see them as being in competition. And you know, that's why, for me, I'm able to kind of do both. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a community of scholars and yeah. curious minds. And then yeah. you uh, took another turn and <laughs> uh, became the president of University of Chicago, which is famous for many, many outstanding accomplishments from the core curriculum for the undergraduate students uh, to the Chicago School of Economics, which has produced no fewer than 14 Nobel Prize winners in economics, and to the 2014 Chicago Principal. Mm -hmm. And Purdue University, uh, under my predecessor Mitch Daniels' leadership, uh, was one of the very first universities to uh, sign up to support the Chicago Principal for free expression. Now, I think of this as at least two additive and distinct reasons. Uh, one is the constitutionally protected right of free speech and free expression, which is arguably the cornerstone of many other rights, liberty, and our democratic system. But then there's a second distinct additive reason that for a place such as a major research university, there is the Paragraph I want to uh, read from directly your university nine years ago. In a word, the university's fundamental commitment is to the principle that debate or deliberation may not be suppressed because the ideas put forward are thought of by some or even by most member of the university community to be offensive unwise, immoral, or wrong-headed. It is for the individual members of the university community, not for the university as an institution, to make those judgments for themselves. Mm -hmm. And to act on those judgments, not by seeking to suppress speech, but by openly and vigorously contesting the ideas that they oppose. I guess, in other words, if you disagree with a speech, you counter with your better speech. Mm -hmm. And towards the end, the Chicago principle of free expression said, without a vibrant commitment to free and open inquiry, a university ceases to be a university. Those are strong words. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh, well, I mean, I think it's the essence of a university. It is, it is the foundational principle of universities. Or, 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 I believe it, it really should be. Um, you know, I think the universities are about being a community of truth-seeking. That's their, that's their 
that's their function in society. Um, and uh, our biggest challenge always is that um, we can be completely wrong. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and that, or, or that we can believe our own idea uh, without having sufficiently examined it from all sides. That's, a, that's a, you know, each one of us, that's our biggest failing is, is that, you know, and, and I'm sure any one of, I'm sure myself, all of us, you know, are susceptible at one point or another to, um, to thinking that something might be the case when it's really not. And um, so this is why this principle is so fundamental to the university because it's about being able to question dogma or being able to question something which somebody wishes to assert from authority or from tradition as opposed to evidence and reason and logic, <laughs> which are the basis that we should be using for uh, how, to, how to find truth. So it, it is situated as a foundational truth of the university uh, that I think is, is deeply fundamental. Uh, and for the University of Chicago, actually, it was founded that way by you know Harper, way back at, the, at its very beginning in 1892, the founding documents of the university privilege academic freedom and freedom of expression as being the, 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 the core principle, many others that surround it, but that's the, that, that's the core principle um, of the university. So uh, at different times and in different eras, pretty much in every era, there's a struggle around this. I mean, in the 1930s, uh, the Illinois uh, legislature established a commission to investigate the university because um, the sense was that the, there were certain faculty who were promoting uh, communism, which they wanted to uh, not have occur. And uh, the president um, um, at the time, uh, Hutchins, uh, you know, was a, a staunch defender, not of communism, but of the rights of those faculty to teach and to have dialogue and of those students to be able to speak their minds. And that tradition has continued all through those decades at the University of Chicago. And I think, you know, at that moment in time when the principles were enumerated, there was a lot of struggle going on again in society around, you know, should we be limiting what people can say? And, and I'm very proud of uh, being president of a university that has stood so strongly for it. Um, when our term starts, which is not for a couple of weeks yet, in uh, October 5th, we'll be launching a new forum Mm -hmm. uh, for free expression at the University of Chicago. And it's going to be a big event for us because it's going to be a place where we try to um, elevate the practice of free expression throughout the university and also uh, to be uh, partners with other uh, universities and other parts of society uh, as we try to grapple with the struggles that, that occur when we have very different points of view. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of... Um, uh, you know, hard uh, um, events that can occur around, uh, around expression that is hurtful to people. So those things have to be discussed and there has to be uh, a culture of um, promoting free expression and, and that's what we have. Well, the constitution of our country made a distinction between actions and thoughts and speech. Yeah. Uh, now your university in 1967 also made a distinction between members of university community yes. versus the university institutionality itself. Yes. So again, I am reading, quote unquote here, from the famous Calvin, the Calvin report, report yeah. from the University of Chicago in 1967. Uh, part of it said the following, quote, the mission of the university is the discovery, improvement, and dissemination of knowledge. A good university like Socrates will be upsetting would be upsetting to faculty, to students, uh, but they have the right to also debate and dissent. Um, well, those were my words, unquote. Back to quoting here. The instrument of dissent and criticism is the individual faculty member or the individual student. The university is the home and sponsor of critics. It is not itself the critic, unquote. End quote. There's no mechanism by which it can reach a collective position without inhibiting that full freedom of dissent on which it thrives. If it takes collective action, therefore, it does so at the price of censoring any minority who do not agree with the view adopted, unquote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And uh, as President I or my predecessors, um, we are... Um, enjoined from uh, taking uh, positions on topics of the day 
Uh, because, I mean, imagine the hypothetical where a president takes a very strong position on a particular topic, and now uh, the university community has to um, respond to that. Mm -hmm. And imagine even that the president ends up appointing a few deans, and then, you know, the deans are involved in uh, the selection of some chairs, and you know, all of a sudden now you've got this whole structure which is saying, oh, this is the way this university thinks. And there's a faculty member who disagrees. I mean, it's just an untenable position, I think. And so I, be I do believe that the Calvin Report is right on. Uh, there is one thing about it that, you know, it's important to mention, which is, the, the, and it is in there, um, the president does have the option or the right or the obligation even, I would say, um, if there's something going on in society which might, for example, um, uh, irretrievably damage the university itself, uh, then there is an ethical obligation to speak uh, on that topic. So, for example, such a thing could occur. Um, let's say there's an environment that seeks to completely limit uh, immigration. Uh, that might have a vast effect on the faculties at the university. There might be under that situation, as has happened in the past, some presidents have taken positions around that particular issue, uh, but always very carefully saying that the context that they're doing it in is to protect the ability of the university to have diverse viewpoints, which is fundamental for it to be able to function and so on. So I think it's a well-reasoned uh, enjoinment, and I, and I do think that um, uh, universities where um, leadership consistently takes a particular set of positions uh, do have a deterioration of the environment for discovery. So it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful and important part of the uh, free expression culture of the university. Mm -hmm. Well, the Kelvin report, uh, again, the Purdue University uh, subscribes to that uh, approach, and that is, is through the restraining of the institutional power that we can enable and maximize individual faculty and students' freedom of expression. Now, I have heard a third reason for freedom of expression, in addition to constitution reason and uh, the reason of a university's values. And that is completely based on operational practicality. <laughs> so now there are, sometimes people will say, I agree with freedom of expression, except I have a list of topics and expressions <laughs> that cannot be free. Uh, and uh, here comes a practical question, and I mean truly as a practical question. Who gets to decide the list of exceptions to freedom of expression? Well, I can think of at least three possible answers, and you help me and President Alivisatos to decipher this. One possible answer is let the president of the university decide. <laughs> Over uh, or a committee so appointed by the president decide. As you alluded to, that's probably not a good idea. In fact, the Stanford provost, who was formerly the dean of the law school a few months ago, published a long article, uh, part of which she said that uh, never in history, and I'm paraphrasing here, never in history uh, throughout the thousands of years of human civilization has it been a good idea for the authority in power to decide what you can think and say or not. Uh, all right, so second idea. How about we answer this practical challenge by voting, all right? 49%, you will have to silence yourself if 51% want you to. I say, wait a moment. First of all, you have to vote every millisecond because the range of topics and people's choices change. So let's say you, you vote every millisecond. <laughs> but wait a moment, isn't the whole point to protect the minority to say even though the majority could win an election and decide resources, taxation, many important choices, but you at least retain the ability to say, I disagree, right? So it doesn't sound right that the minority's ability to disagree should be abolished by the majority. So that leaves us with only the third possible logical answer, and that is, Paul, you write down a list of things that cannot be freedom of expression. You pass uh -huh. the paper to me, I write down my list, I give it to VJ, you write down your list, keep going, right? Everybody gets a chance. And then once it's done in this auditorium, we have to do it through campus, and then we have to do it throughout the state of Indiana. And then at the end, you get the list back. You take the union of the list that cannot be uttered. 
I'm not sure if there's still any might need for human language left, huh? yeah. 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 at that point. Wouldn't be much left. So yeah. practically, I don't know. Sounds like let the president decide what you can and cannot say. <laughs> well, <clears throat> no, no, I already said that's not a good idea. I'm not advocating for that. Just want to be clear. Uh, yeah. uh, well, um, but you know, but yes, if, I, go ahead. if I could just say though, you know, I do think that um, when we think about um, the 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 role that universities play within our society. Uh, it is, uh, it, you know, it does have its kind of its own unique characteristics, and and one of them is to um, to be a place of seeking truth, whether it's uh, whether it's discovering new knowledge or whether it's people learning it, you know, from from what people have discovered previously. Um, but also, it's about the um, habits that allow a person to be in dialogue across difference. That that's something that. Um, that's a, that's a culture that can be uh, cultivated and learned. And in my view, it's also, um, that's why universities are thought of as being so foundational to democracies. And uh, to, the, uh, to Jenny Martinez's point from Stanford about the, you know, when authorities are controlling what can be said, well, pretty soon, you know, to my mind, uh, that will degrade any university that's there, but also, the health of universities is, I think, an, a key piece of the health of democracies. So I, I think these are really weighty and important issues, and um, uh, I, our commitment to these uh, to these principles is is very consequential. Well, it would degrade all free people and all free societies, uh, yeah. and I'm constantly reminded by many that uh, uh, the topics we hold near and dear to our heart today were not too long ago all taboo topics yeah. that could not be debated. Well, um, switching gear a little bit, um, University of Chicago is also known for many outstanding academic units, including your medical school and your hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I heard you're opening a hospital in our state of Indiana now. Yeah, that's right, in Crown Point in Northwest Indiana, that's right. Uh, How's that it's going? It's nearby. And <laughs> it's going well. I mean, it's being built. It's very right close now. to Purdue Northwest, for example. Yeah, I think it is. That's right. So it's it's um, um, you know there's a there's a growing population there, and um, our 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 goal is to be able to help serve that population. And uh, so it's exciting for us to have that uh, project coming up. It's still under construction. I think I can't remember when it's. I should have looked it up before I came, but. Um, it's probably nine months or something away mm -hmm. from, um, from being finished, something like that. How many beds uh, are we looking at here? A couple of hundred. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and it will have specific uh, functions, uh, but it will also, of course, connect to the, um, to the Hyde Park Medical Center where there's a larger suite of services mm -hmm. and so on. But um, yeah, I think it's very exciting for us. And, and I also think it's true that today, um, the nature of um, how medicine works is um, in some ways we get, we'll get we get the best service uh, and the best outcomes when we have lots of ways for people to get um, screening and, and, and early um, uh, medical uh, advice and so on. But there's typically a you know, smaller number of um, places where we can offer, uh, you know, when we do need it, uh, interventions that are at a higher end. So, so you know, these kind of models where we have more distributed um, uh, service areas, and then you know, those help to help patients that when when the need arises to be able to come to a specialty location, they serve mm -hmm. they serve well. And I know that uh, some of the faculty colleagues from University of Chicago and from Purdue earlier today had a second round of conversation of potential partnerships in research collaboration and train, uh, trainee uh, program uh, in different hospitals and clearly Purdue, uh, even though we don't have a uh, human hospital, we have great vet med hospital. Oh my gosh, I was blown away today yes. when I got to see some of those uh, things. Absolutely, yeah. well, you know, one health, animal health, plant health, human health, uh, and uh, the uh, biomedical engineering uh, dimension as well. So what do you see as the potential of that collaborative spirit between the two universities? Oh gosh, I'm so excited about this. I think that uh, you know we're, we're, we're nearby, we're in the same region. And um, 
you know, I, just to talk more uh, broadly about this, I do believe that there's a changing role of universities in societies because of the importance of knowledge economies and the role that universities play in the creation and dissemination of knowledge. You know, so that, that, that's a kind of change of the positioning of universities. And um, to my mind, uh, the regional uh, cooperation is really very important. Uh, economies do operate on regional scales. They don't just operate very locally near one university, and these partnerships matter a lot. And one of the things that we should always be looking for when we're trying to, to um, create, in the, to take what we're capable of and to add in the best way for society is to find complementarity. Um, and so, for example, um, I think you told me. Uh, do you want to repeat again how many faculty there are in engineering at Purdue? Is it well, you should ask the dean of college okay. of engineering, but I think something around. I think you've uh, you might number, know something a, about it. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of tenure, tenure track, I think it's around 460-ish. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, so, so the University of Chicago has a, an engineering program, and it's about 30 faculty. <laughs> I think it's, a, and you know, as you pointed out, we have a really, um, uh, a large medical enterprise and it's growing. And uh, I think the intersections of engineering and medicine are very fertile, uh, um, is a very fertile ground for cooperation and for discovery and to, um, to benefit humanity. So I think there's a lot that we can do together in that space. Uh, I suspect that there's many others, but that, that feels like one we should, definitely, uh, mm -hmm. we should definitely explore in some depth. And I know there's a lot of faculty interest in that, so that's great. Yep. That's the key. Because it doesn't matter what you say or what I say. As it you doesn't. Know. It doesn't. Well, you know, one reason I love still having my research group mm. is that, um, you know, when I go and spend time with my coworkers mm. and their, their efforts to try to mm. grow as scientists and to, mm. to make new discoveries. So, you know, I'm, I'm down where the university really operates, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's fascinating to be there and listening to the conversations and then to imagine, oh, you know, up here, the president's mm -hmm. saying something. Mm -hmm. and, and does, that, mm -hmm. <laughs> does that get anywhere down there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a kind of ground truth that comes uh, from being yes. right there at the, at where, where, where the real stuff's happening. Uh, yes, know? well, uh, I love for it. me, you I know, love doing it. some research on weekends is one helpful way to there keep sanity. Go. Exactly. Uh, it there does, are other ways. Has, Eating ice cream also keeps that works. sanity. You know? Yeah, that uh, works. Yeah. But doing research keeps sanity. And as you said, Paul, that indeed uh, you are reminded why we're in this academia in the first place. Uh, plus, then you realize the beauty of academia is that the faculty don't have to listen to the president whatsoever anyway. So, uh, and uh, that's fantastic. So, you 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 have. Uh, you, you have this notion of a regional economic development, right? And of course, Northwest Indiana is uh, uh, your neighbor. That's right. uh, you can't tell where you cross the state. Well, I guess you can, perhaps. But uh, the time zone is also the same. You know, we are on East Coast time zone. But once you pass a certain point, then you are in Chicago time. You are in Central time zone as well. Now, there's been conversation to say Northwest Indiana, there's hydrogen hub opportunities. Yes. There is quantum corridor and optic fiber data center opportunities. And there is health opportunities. Uh, and there is perhaps semiconductor economic growth, creating jobs and talents, innovation together. Uh, what's your vision for the Northwest Indiana part of your neighborhood? Well, I mean, look, I, I'm completely um, aligned with um, everything that you just said. I think there's some areas um, that are, um, it, it, it's very fascinating to be, um, first of all, the population there is growing, uh, as, as we know, but also, um, you know, borders are fascinating places. <laughs> Um, when you're at an interface between two things, the possibilities of interaction increase enormously. They're much more interesting than things that are just right smack in the middle of something in general. And so I love that idea of uh, cooperation across that border. And the areas that you just mentioned are fascinating ones to me. I, I just put on a little scientist hat here for a second again and say, you know, um, I look at um, this moment of what's happening with science and technology and um, I, I see some areas of profound revolutions going on. Um, I'm a huge fan because I'm a nanoscientist of, of, of Feynman, you know, who was such a visionary in that area. And he had this famous phrase, 
Um, that which I cannot create, I do not understand. Mm. That which I cannot create, I do not understand. Uh, I love that. And it turns out that in the world of science, you know, in, in um, areas of biological engineering, um, in areas of um, data science and, and, and artificial intelligence, and in areas of quantum information, all of a sudden, we can start to create things, not just try to, you know, observe them. All of a sudden, we have these abilities to actually create things in those domains that weren't there before. And to me, that means that there's going to be this astonishing range of outcomes uh, for, for the benefit of humanity in so many ways and for the improvement of economies. So the areas that you just mentioned, I mean, you know, look, we're right there. We're right next to each other. There's some, you know, things to, to uh, cross-fertilize on. And we're also this incredible period when the possibilities for, for, um, for new discovery that will help uh, drive economies are just off scale. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Absolutely. You know, uh, my predecessor Mitch would say, you know, we always welcome refugees from the neighboring state of Illinois. Uh, I'm going to save that, Paul. Um, for University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. <laughs> they are going to visit us, I believe, at our so homecoming glad. game. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yes. All right. I'm going to save that uh, tagline uh, <laughs> later this month for, for our Big Ten neighbor there. Uh, but um, you're right. You know, there's a lot of complementarity between the two institutions, a lot of yeah. shared values as well. Last time yeah. I saw you was actually in May at G7, when you signed the uh, U.S.-Japan collaboration Quantum uh, and uh, Purdue, along with others, signed the semiconductor together in the same room. Uh, now, right. we also try to be uh, inspired by nearby institutions. and We want to learn from the best. Mm. We are certainly looking at the Booth School, your <laughs> business school, yeah. as an uh, inspiration there. And we aspire uh, to be academically just as strong. Uh, we do have a reimagined and relaunched business school, the yeah. Mitchell E. Daniels, Daniels Jr. Yeah. School of Business, ESB. Any advice for our business school colleagues? And uh, we recruited a brand new dean, uh, Dr. Jim Bullard, who was the longest serving president of a Federal Reserve Bank just last month. Uh, he was for 15 years the president of uh, Fed in St. Louis. Uh, and we're doing a lot of, I think, fantastic things in business school education and research. Uh, but Booth has done amazing work over many decades. Uh, any yeah. advice? Well, I mean, there, it is kind of an amazing school, the Booth, and I love going there. Um, uh, it's an, it, the energy level is so high. You know, I guess I'll say a couple of things about it. One of them is um, it shares a characteristic with places that are the best. And one of those characteristics is that the faculty and the students there don't see themselves as constrained by boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, probably, I hope I don't get into trouble for saying this, probably the best psychology department at the University of Chicago is the behavioral economics group <laughs> at Booth. <laughs> because um, they could see at a certain point that uh, that lens of looking at things uh, was a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't hesitate. They just went in and you know, grew in that area, even though that wasn't what business schools were doing at that time. I mean, now there's a lot of programs like that. But when they did it, there was nobody doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and you know, they didn't sit there and say to themselves, well, that sounds like it's related to psychology. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. You know, they just said, "This is important. This is great. Let's go. Let's go grab and do this." Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's really exciting. And in fact, actually, <laughs> if you visit Booth, it feels like it's its own kind of university almost because of the diversity of kinds of approaches and thoughts that they bring to mm -hmm. things. And, and I just love that feeling. You know, this mm -hmm. sense of being unbounded. Mm -hmm. um, they're also, though, I'd say, um, terrifically entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and very. Um, you know, they have that New Chicago ethos. They, they, they have a style. And, and I think any great, you know, academic program is going to develop ultimately a kind of style. And, and the Booth style is to be very uh, quantitative, rigorous. You know, it's a real New Chicago kind of style. 
Um, and and they, they do it magnificently. So, so, you know, those are kind of two things, to have a kind of ethos style, a way of thinking, a, a way of interacting, and then to not feel constrained. I mean, those are two big things that I would say, you know, you want to launch something that's going to be really great. If you can infuse those values, it's going to go really well. Mm. And maybe one last thing. You've got a university already here that's world class in, in a number of areas. Um, you know, partnerships will help a lot. Yeah. Yes. Well, we do have some amazing colleagues uh, in the uh, Daniel School of Business, yeah. and you are right. Uh, being unbounded by uh, nothing except one's own imagination, and certainly be unbounded by the organizational stovepipes. Uh, any advice for our students? Let's uh, open the question to the floors here. We may have a few students with questions yes, for all. students. Please. <laughs> Hi. Thank you, President Chain and President Alvisatos. Um, I'm honored to be able to ask a question. My name is Matt Sockler. I'm a senior working towards a degree in political science and communication, and I have a minor in business econ. Um, my question is, in your experience, how has exposure to liberal arts disciplines influenced your approach to fostering innovation and creativity within your scientific teams or projects? Oh, wow. Okay, so first a personal story and then a broader one. So, you know, I was an undergrad at the University of Chicago, and um, I did sort of start off a little bit in chemistry, and then I had this kind of encounter with uh, organic chemistry that didn't go so well. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so I started wandering the university. Now I feel very much related. Yeah, it was, it was, it was just to call it a disaster. I told you physical chemistry worked out for me, so, you know, there you go. But, but organic was just, it was bad. And, and so I started wandering the university looking for things. And, and I, you know, I ended up taking, beyond the Common Core, a whole bunch of classes in the humanities, a couple in social sciences as well. And, and I really considered shifting over in that direction, but you know, I didn't in the end. But I will say this, that um, because of the, uh, the kinds of ways of thinking in those disciplines that were so powerful, uh, that I will say as a scientist even today, I use things that I learned from that experience <laughs> probably more than the very specific things that I had learned in science classes as a student. Because these were really trying to ask, to come at knowledge from different perspectives, to be able to ask the deep question, not the facile one. Uh, it, was, it was really, uh, as a human being, still, you know, th these were formative experiences for me. It's one of the reasons I went back, to, you know, to want to be at the University of Chicago. And I will say that I think uh, that, um, that those disciplines um, undergird so much of what it means uh, for a university to be, uh, to be what it is. So I'm very proud that the University of Chicago has very strong humanities. It's unexcelled almost in social science. And I just think those are extraordinary and special disciplines that, that you know, without them, we'd be lost. Well, uh, thank you again, President Chang and President Olivia Santos for speaking tonight. Uh, my name is Sam Wadlington. Uh, I'm a junior in integrated business and engineering at the new Daniel School of Business. Oh, all uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and my question tonight is about leadership. So what key qualities do you believe are essential for effective leadership in the fields of science and academia? Wow. That's such a fascinating question because, you know, it turns out that um, there's one thing I will say <laughs> that I think is pretty fundamental, uh, which is uh, some sense of authenticity, no matter what kind of leader you are, is really, if you're going to try to lead something, it has to be because of, um, because of really believing in what that institution does. And uh, people around you will know that, whether that's real or not. So, you know, that, that seems like an irreducible criterion. But having said that, I think leaders uh, vary a lot. And there's not one <laughs> kind. <laughs> uh, and it's important to... Um, to recognize that, um, that those different styles can each bring something to an organization. In fact, we were chatting earlier today about, you know, what, what, what's the, um, is there such a thing as the right time scale to be a, a, a president, for example, of a university? You know? And, you know, some people might feel like that's a sensitive topic, but I don't. I mean, you know, I think, you know, in the end, uh, I feel like there's 
a given leader will have a certain way of being and a certain um, set of issues that they can bring to help a community to grow in certain dimensions. And then when they've done that, you know, maybe they've served and they should find another function to do in life. <laughs> Well, you know, I can assure Sorry. you that the president's <laughs> job is going to be the, among the first to be displaced by AI. Uh, there you go. Uh, very little job security in face of uh, the surge of uh, all the uh, chat GPTs. Well, uh, this makes me wonder, we should turn the mic back to students, but you said, that Richard Feynman said, if you cannot create it, you don't fully understand it. Now, for AI and machines, even if they could create something, do they understand it? <laughs> well, this is going to be a really interesting ride. And <laughs> you can trash talk all the AI as much as you want here. Uh, no, I don't want to. Uh, you know, I will say this. <laughs> I will say this, that when ChatGPT first came out on you know, like first couple of days, um, a, a Forbes reporter, uh, you know, the people trying to test it out, see what it would do and what it wouldn't. And, I, you know, perhaps you know, the University of Chicago, we have this uh, tradition it's very Chicago-like, of uh, we have the quirky essay questions. You know, mm. so, so for admissions, there are these questions that are just kind of bizarre questions. And, and actually, the students compete to create them and so on. And so, uh, you know, like one was find X. And that was it. That was the whole question. And you know, a student could say, they could riff on that, do what they what they felt would so say students something. students create the questions? Or, or well, they compete and then, Faculty create the questions? No, 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 no. Students right. propose uh, the, the, the quirky questions and then, you know, there's a you know, process for selecting amongst those. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, you don't have to answer the quirky question. You can enter, you know, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you know, we sort of, we're, that's kind of our approach is, you know, tell us why you should come here. But, but, but the quirky questions are kind of, you know, they're well known. Mm. And so the Forbes reporter took all the quirky questions and, and fed them to the chat GPT. And, and I guess I would just say that that program was not going to be admitted. Uh, uh -huh. um, that program was not going to be admitted. But that doesn't mean, you know, I, I just think this is a fascinating time to understand, you know, obviously it's correlative, it's taking existing knowledge and then it's kind of, you know, refashioning it and so on. Can it be creative in that sense? There's no, there's no indication of that that I've really seen at this point. But it does absolutely find things that people would really struggle to do. So it's, it's an amazing, interesting, exciting time. Uh, and I think it's really worthy of study. One more question thing on the leadership that I just may, may mm -hmm. you know, better make sure I do say. I mean, I said authenticity, but I also want to make sure that a leader should really um, do their utmost to uh, exemplify and to the best of their ability to, to uphold the values of their community. You know, if they don't do that, <laughs> uh, other things are going to not go well. Uh, and, and, you know, that's all we, we're all human beings, those are all these struggles, but that's what, you know, a, a leader, a, you know, a leader that really catches will have at least those characteristics for sure. Many others may vary. Well, let's take one more question from students. Thank you again, uh, President Alvis Atos and President Chang. My name is Kevin Bass. I'm a first year PhD student in mechanical engineering. My question is, what words of advice do you have for college students to gain inner confidence when it comes to pursuing opportunities? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, boy. That's such an important question. And, um, you know, uh, that is such an important question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, I do want to say that, um, you know, there's this tendency to kind of look at um, examples where somebody has been successful. <laughs> and then there's always this kind of almost like um, an aura of inevitability about it. <laughs> I can tell you, people who are successful stumbled around a lot and made piles, <laughs> piles of mistakes along the way. Things that would probably embarrass them enormously. They did stupid things. You know, all those things are just human, parts of being humans, right? So the one thing you don't want to do is have a situation where you feel like, oh, other people are so good at doing everything and maybe I, I am not. And I think to recognize that success really will come when you find something that you find either um, beautiful or that you care about or that motivates you in a special way. And, and you know, you'll find your level of success in that if you stay with that and you don't abandon it too quickly. So, so the inner confidence should come from a sense of, um, 
joy in what you're doing, then, then it should all come together. That's, that's my best advice on that. Mm. Well, that gives me an idea to ask you, you know, what was the most embarrassing part of your career? But well, let me not ask that. Uh, uh, let me not ask that, because uh, in case hey, it's a dialogue, you ask me back. Uh, I mean, that, then I don't know where to start. So I usually abuse my power uh, to uh, ask Why not? the last question. Why not? Uh, so let me ask the last questions of the evening here, uh, <laughs> no. although we can keep on going. Although, you know, there's you the traffic. You can't ask a harder question than the students. It's not, it's just. Oh. Oh. Well, then I don't have any. <laughs> okay, well, no, no, I, I was to ask a question. Uh, you know, we can keep on going, but uh, I know that uh, Paul needs to be back in Chicago later tonight. And, you know, in theory, it takes two hours. But in theory, there's no traffic either. So, uh, well, so here's the question. Um, you were an outstanding scientist and entrepreneur and leading a national lab uh, and now you're a university president which is kind of a little different from all of the above. Uh, in your past two plus years as president of the University of Chicago, what was the most surprising moment? I said, oh, wow. Now, it could be a good surprising. It could be bad surprising. So last spring, uh, I walked out onto the quads because it was the first beautiful day, and you know what I mean, you know. It's, uh, you mean June 1? Yeah, <laughs> might have been, <laughs> might have been, you know. And, and I have to say, you know, as a transplant back to Chicago, uh, you know, uh, obviously I love the University of Chicago because, you know, the weather doesn't, you know, doesn't do that for you. But I actually like the winter, but I don't really like those long, that long tail, you know, that just goes on for a long time. So it was a beautiful day, and all the students were out on the quads, so I just decided, okay. Much better than Indiana, by I the way. Much, much better. That tail is a lot shorter, you know. Okay. We have beautiful days, so, so I got as rid early of this as stuff. May 15th. I got rid of this stuff. I put on some jeans and a T-shirt. All the students were sitting there out on the quads. So I just went out and started hanging out on the quad, talking to students, you know. And um, I met a, um, uh, a young uh, Nigerian man. Uh, I ended up having a conversation, he told me what he was studying, it was data science and something else. I don't know, it was, you know, like just data science and philosophy, something, you, know, you Chicago type kid, you know, amazing. And we're in this dialogue and then, you know, he says, okay, I want you to meet some other people. And he starts taking me around. And uh, before I knew it, I had met uh, this huge number of students that were at the University of Chicago from Nigeria. It turns out there were 77. Uh, I got invited subsequently to one of their events, and there they were. I was just like, you know, I think about the world we're in, and the fact that we're part of a community of trying to create new knowledge together, and that there are people from all these different backgrounds and cultures working together to make a better world. I, I just love that, you know? And that was just like, wow, mm -hmm. it's a great moment. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have graduate degree programs for that young man from Nigeria to yeah. attend at Purdue. Uh, 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 then like many outstanding- He might want to uh, bring the whole double cohort. You know? uh, <laughs> We can look into that as well. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Mitch uh, once said uh, to many of us uh, that uh, he really believes that Purdue will become that intellectual bridge between the two coasts. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you have the similar vision for yeah. your university as well. I just want to tell you how excited we are that there's both Purdue and the University of Chicago in close proximity with each other yeah. in ways more than one. Yeah. So um, I hope uh, all of you enjoyed this conversation. Make sure you check out the Science and Nature papers uh, <laughs> uh, by President <laughs> Alivisados. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice